Um, before we uh, jump into the panel, I just wanted to uh, give a little bit of um, a background and talk about exactly what uh, what do we mean by habitat quality? And uh, Scott set things up um, uh, really well in, in both the, the literature review and in his presentation, but just to uh, reiterate some points and um, kind of uh, put the, the, this panel into uh, the, the context of habitat quality. First off, uh, habitat quality uh, for desert tourists is mentioned repeatedly and the uh, recovery plan. Uh, for example, recovery criterion three specifies that there's, there should be no net loss of habitat within tourist conservation areas, but it goes further to say that the condition of habitat should also be demonstrably improving because it's this condition or um, uh, quality of habitat that affects reproductive success and survival. And that's what uh, uh, Scott was talking about, about connecting uh, habitat and habitat restoration to tortoises. So uh, therefore recovery action 5.1 in the plan uh, addresses that need to connect habitat data to tortoise demographic data by calling for research to identify specific measurable characteristics that contribute to high rates of survival, reproduction, and recruitment that can then be used to inform uh, recovery efforts. It would also be helpful to identify uh, thresholds below which habitat degradation is so severe that uh, the habitat fails to, to provide the minimum conditions for occupancy. In order to uh, reach this point of of, of having uh, measurable characteristics uh, that we can tie to uh, tortoise demographic rates. Recovery Action 5.2 recommends rec uh, research that uh, correlates habitat restoration with tortoise population status. So all of this stuff, one way to uh, think about this is to think back to the uh, photo that Scott showed of the unburned habitat on one side and the, and the uh, habitat that had burned 50 years ago on the right side of the photograph. And uh, that photo basically depicted the endpoints of a spectrum from nearly fully denuded to undisturbed. And so the question uh, about habitat quality is what characteristics along that spectrum can be measured and targeted as uh, restoration goals to, to achieve uh, acceptable or high rates of survival, uh, reproduction, and recruitment. Then, of course, uh, Scott reviewed uh, uh, habitat quality as well in, in his review, um, pointing out that habitat uh, can be generalized as comprising cover, food, water, and safety. And then um, he described some important research uh, questions to get beyond these generalizations that are uh, similar to those in the recovery plan. Beginning first with um, uh, research that improves the linkage between habitat enhancement and uh, tortoise uh, indicators of tortoise health and population traits, and then addressing whether comprehensive habitat restoration is capable of reversing declining indicators of health and uh, population declines as well. So until these types of questions are uh, uh, addressed or uh, th these research, these, this kind of research is implemented, it's gonna be hard to understand the, the role that habitat restoration could have in aiding tortoise recovery. So uh, with this as our uh, context, I want to uh, now introduce our panel and um, you can uh, go ahead and uh, turn on your uh, cameras if you haven't already. And uh, the panel is selected because they've all uh, collectively studied specific habitat features that Scott mentioned in uh, uh, his review, including the full spectrum of, of uh, tortoise 
life stages. So uh, uh, quick, uh, briefly, I'll just give brief introductions and then we'll let everyone uh, uh, elaborate. But uh, Dr. Christine Berry is a principal investigator with the Western Ecological Research Center at the US Geological Survey. And her research has included tourist foraging behavior, use of habitats in the Mojave and Western Mojave deserts, and recovery of vegetation after disturbance. Welcome, Christine. Uh, Dr. Todd Eskew is a research ecology also in the Western Ecological Research Center of USGS. He studied aspects of tourist habitat for at least 30 years. And he and his lab have focused on specific questions about habitat quality uh, in, in the last several years. So uh, welcome to uh, Todd. Next up, Dr. Uh, Ron Swaysgood serves uh, as uh, the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance as the Brown Endowed Director of Recovery Ecology. He oversees several species conservation programs locally in Southern California and around the globe. Hi, Ryan. Next up, Dr. Brian Todd is a professor of conservation biology at UC Davis. And along with Drs. Kurt Buhlman and Tracy Tuberville of the University of, of Georgia Savannah River Ecology Lab, they have been running a Mojave Desert Tourist Head Starting Research Program since 2011 in the Mojave National Preserve, where they have also studied habitat selection of juvenile desert tortoises. Welcome, Todd, or Brian. And uh, Malia, are you? Uh, hopefully, Malia is on. I saw her on early. There we go. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Malia Nafis is a research ecologist with uh, USGS's Fort Collins Science Center. Uh, she's now working on things like brown tree snakes, uh, but she uh, in the past has worked with uh, uh, Todd, Ron, and Brian on uh, related projects of, of juveniles and uh, habitat selection and things like that. And uh, so welcome to uh, Malia. Um, so to uh, kick things off, I'll just ask, I, I wanna ask each panelist to give a kind of a brief elevator description of how your current or past research has related to questions about habitat uh, quality. And we'll go kind of round robin just to let you elaborate on your introductions to uh, uh, as they relate to um, this workshop and the, and the panel. And since uh, Brian Todd is the first box in my Hollywood Squares layout, I'll just start with you. Hi there, can you hear me? Looks like it. Um, thanks for having us. Um, our program, as you heard, is about um, primarily focused on recruitment of, of juvenile desert tortoises. And we've done a lot of research on, on head starting. How do you raise juvenile desert tortoises in captivity effectively and in a healthy and safe way for the animals uh, that when they're released, they can contribute to local populations. Um, and so we're sort of focused on the recruitment angle of desert tortoise recovery. And part of that recruitment is looking at how tortoises survive in the wild and how they're using habitat when they're released from captivity. And um, Early on in our project for the first four or five years, we were really focused on um, getting a baseline for how tortoises are using habitat without manipulation from head starting. And so we would release hatchling desert tortoises days after they hatched, up to as late as about a year to a year and a half after they had hatched, with very little head starting manipulation, and release them right into the wild where their mothers were living with um, radio uh, transmitter tags attached to their carapaces. And then we would look at uh, habitat selection. And so uh, Malia was actually one of my first graduate students and worked on this project, um, collected a lot of these data. And for the first two or three years, we were collecting uh, data every week or twice a week on these juvenile tortoises as they were surviving and moving around the landscape inside the, the northeastern side of the Mojave uh, National Preserve. And um, given the time frame, given that we only had about 46 to 48 animals that we were releasing directly into the wild like that without a lot of head start manipulation. 
uh, we kind of focus on, on coarser scale metrics. We collect the data on sort of the prevalence of annual plants and things that comprise the forage, uh, the food matter for the tortoises. But um, after analyzing all of the data over a few years, what we actually found was probably in part because of the scale at which we were collecting data, we saw things like the, the value of perennial plants and um, other parts of the, the desert community really showed up as important in where the tortoises were choosing to spend their time. So in particular, uh, we found that uh, these juvenile tortoises, and again, we're talking about hatchlings up to about a year and a half of age, were uh, principally spending their time in burrows that were dug by uh, small mammals, probably Merriam's kangaroo rats for the most part, where we are, um, that they prefer to spend time associated with creosote bushes, uh, one of the two dominant perennial plants, and that they were actually less commonly found associated with white bursage, the other dominant perennial plant, um, and that both their burrows and occasionally where the animals were found when they were moving around foraging tended to be a little bit closer to uh, desert washes than random points were. Um, and when you think about you know, what perennial plants represent, uh, in particular these big creosotes, what small mammal burrows represent, what being near a wash represents, and you think about the definition that, that Scott gives for habitat, you've got cover, food, water, and safety, and probably all four of those are encapsulated in these sort of uh, uh, we'll call them microhabitat, but large scale, relatively uh, consistent permanent features in contrast to things that were harder to measure like these ephemeral annual forage plants. Um, I guess that's it for my spiel for now. Cool, thanks, Brian. Um, Leah, you wanna uh, kind of uh, pick up from there and kind of describe how uh, your past work uh, relates to the panel? Yeah, um, so as Roy mentioned, I've had the good fortune of working with most of the people on this panel through various um, phases of my career and in the context of their broader, larger scale programs, um, starting first as a graduate student and then working through my postgraduate um, career prior to shifting over to invasive species ecology. but. Um, my primary, I would say, focus within the desert tortoise realm has really been the application of behavioral ecology in tortoises to improve understanding of how to identify um, habitat quality indicators and or to better understand how to improve survival or site fidelity of animals after they've been released both in the head starting and translocation context. Um, of species management. And so as just a really quick, broad example, um, one of the areas that I focused on through multiple phases of my career is developing sort of a multi-pronged approach to identify um, possible differences between habitats in which tortoises survive and do well um, versus those where they might be more detectable during visual surveys. And, and um, so understanding potentially the difference in where you see tortoises when you're going out and monitoring the landscape and they're readily detectable versus where tortoises are truly surviving and may be less detectable and really interpreting that in the context of the fact that this is a cryptic species and therefore their survival should be tied to their ability to avoid detection. Great, thanks, uh, Malaya. Uh, Ron. Well, you'll, you'll notice some commonalities here. Um, and and I, I too, I've worked with everyone else on this, on this panel. Um, but, you know, I think, and this is something we do across a number of species, and we look at translocations as an opportunity to learn about species biology, ecology, behavior, and, um, and habitat requirements, and, and that certainly, with uh, the desert tortoise, that's the approach we've taken. Um, and when, when we're translocating, uh, most of these are head starting programs, but um, uh, we, we have this fantastic opportunity to manipulate some of the um, characteristics at the release site and understand more about uh, you know, habitat preferences and you know, different population vital rates and survival um, as a function of the habitat we release them in. And this is for a species that's particularly hard to study 
um, you know, in, in nature, particularly the juveniles are, are, are difficult to locate and track. So um, we can get our hands on large numbers of individuals by head starting them. Um, you know, one of the things just to, to sort of, you know, maybe share a different com component of what we're doing is, you know, looking at uh, habitat quality, obviously the food resources are extremely important, um, but also uh, we look at predation as being the result of a combination of you know, the presence and behavior of the predators, but also um, the behavior of the prey and the, the habitat of the prey and the ability for um, the, the habitat to provide refuge and camouflage. So a lot of our research questions have revolved around looking at those characteristics so um, density of small mammal burrows is a great predictor of dispersal um, and survival. Um, uh, we look at dispersal after release as an indicator of accepting or rejecting the habitat. So the better the habitat, the more likely they're gonna be anchored to that site. So it's a great opportunity to learn uh, about those preferences. Um, also the, uh, the substrate, that uh, a rocky substrate can provide can reduce detection as Malia was alluding to and releasing um, animals on a rocky substrate can reduce dispersal, increase survival in particular can reduce um, predation rates. Um, so, so those are the kinds of things um, that we're, we've been looking at. Um, and we, I mean, obviously we, we wanna look, we wanna examine um, survival. That's the most important and, you know, and, and the population response. But as many others have alluded to, there's an opportunity to learn uh, you know, um, other aspects of um, how habitat quality affects um, the tortoises by measuring some of the behavior. So, um, as I mentioned, dispersal from the release site. Also, home range can be an indicator. Um, animals have to, you know, typically have larger home ranges where the resources are spread thinner on the ground. So, that's another indicator. Um, and, uh, and, of course, growth and health. Um, or other um, uh, parameters that we look at. And then um, I guess, you know, to, what we found just briefly is that um, looking at those, if, if we combined uh, the density of the small mammal burrows, uh, the, the, the rocky substrate, and then vegetation community, which I haven't really talked about, we could increase survival from close to 0% to above 80% just by manipulating uh, what they experience at the release site. So um, that's with the juvenile tortoises. So it can have pretty profound effects. Thank you. Cool, thanks, Ryan. Uh, I'll just move to the right of my uh, grid and uh, ask, uh, let Todd uh, describe uh, his research program. Hey, uh, thanks for inviting me, Roy. Uh, I'm going to make some points. I, I wrote them down so I'll inflict you guys with me as briefly as possible and as succinctly as possible. Uh, there's two parts to my program that I want to discuss very briefly. The first part has a lot to do with uh, a program that the BLM in California um, asked Leslie DeFalco to lead and I'm a co-PI on. So I'll just mention the topics and she'll have an opportunity later to go into some of the details. And then uh, also uh, very recently, we've been working on some other uh, tortoise research specifically uh, getting into this, but uh, I had no idea uh, the depth and the scope that BLM had planned for our program in desert restoration when I started out. And I, I I don't know that I was paying attention as well as I should have in the beginning, but Peggy Allwell, Fred Edwards, and Christina Lund uh, asked us to work first on a uh, priority species list for uh, diet and cover plants of desert tortoises in the Mojave Desert. And so uh, we worked on a synthesis, uh, drawing on all the information that was published that we had avail uh, available to us, as well as some unpublished data where, uh, where that was necessary. And we put that synthesis together. It was only published uh, in late, 2021 in about November in the Natural Areas Journal. Uh, and it has a, um, I would say, don't miss the, um, the pretty extensive appendix that is a um, species accounts for some 90 species of plants that we uh, feel are, are valuable for tortoise habitats in the desert, as well as pollinators. Uh, while that was being developed, we used it extensively in the restoration and materials development program uh, under Judy Perkins' leadership. Uh, the next thing they asked us to do was to put together a provisional seed transfer zone. 
So using environmental variables and considering the variability of ecotypes of the plants that are across the desert, the Mojave Desert, we were asked to uh, try to put together a product that could be used to um, determine where the plants would best be used with regard to ecotypes. And so uh, there is a uh, provisional seed transfer zone published for the southwestern U.S. that goes Colorado Plateau, Great Basin, Sonoran Desert, Mojave Desert, and I think the Madrean Archipelago. Um, that was guided um, by the work that we did on the priority species list. But then right behind that, uh, Dan Shryock, who works with us, put together an online tool called Climate Mapper, which you can pick the site where you need to do restoration. Um, and, it, and it will um, help indicate where you should select your seed, again, based on environmental variables. So these are what we call provisional seed transfer zones and provisional seed uh, menu work because uh, we don't have the specifics of the genetics yet incorporated in and the plant performance. But all of that was integrated with a network of common gardens that go from St. George, Utah, um, over to Ridgecrest and down to Joshua Tree. And where we're growing, uh, we started out with Sphralsia ambigua, which you've heard a lot about, Ambrosia demosa and creosote bush in those gardens, as well as some grasses now and some Joshua trees. And we're working on the plant performance from the ecotypes across the range of the species and then uh, in relation to their genetics in some detail. And that's collaboration with um, California Botanical Gardens. Um, and then shifting over to the work that is more tortoise specific, um, as we moved along, uh, we went through the Ivanpah Connectivity Project, which a lot of people have, have heard about where the translocation was involved. Um, I wanted to say that um, all of you, uh, all the folks here worked on juvenile tortoises before I did. And I think it was when Malia came and worked over in our lab that um, she brought, she imported the work on the juvenile tortoises. And I didn't really want to work on little tortoises because I knew it was really a pain. And, and Ron pointed it out. Brian pointed it out. It, it, there's so many things that can go wrong, uh, but the science demanded that we did it because big tortoises are so resilient to the problems that come up in the desert that you don't know what's wrong until it's too late with an adult tortoise sometimes. Uh, we're still working on finding better metrics for the health of, the, of adult desert tortoises, but using juveniles is when we had the big breakthrough of the paper that Scott mentioned, which was on the red brome. And I think that was to us, uh, it was a breakthrough because I could see we finally got through to most of the community on how bad brome was and exactly how bad it was in multiple ways in the diet of desert tortoises. But what? But then um, Laura Cobelt, um, Mark Slaughter and, uh, and JJ Smith uh, started asking us questions where they wanted to know, okay, taking that information about the red brome, how are we going to understand if our ACECs are of sufficient size and habitat quality to support the recovery of desert tortoises? And in order to approach that problem, we, um, we, we got together. It was, it was a difficult. We went round and round on what is the management-related question that we can do research on that will get to that. We eventually got to incorporating the AIM program, which is a national program now, and we're all going to be end up using it. We are using it. It's, it's, a, it's a done deal. And incorporating that with ancillary ways of measuring the habitat, including uh, with uh, drone and at remote, near remote and far remote with satellite data to understand how can we remotely sense these vast areas that we have to look at. Because just putting down plant transects doesn't seem to be getting it. I've been doing it, like Roy said, uh, painfully for over 30 years. And we don't know enough, I don't think yet. So now we're gonna to try to do that. The last part I think is the most important that we can um, mention regarding uh, restoration and desert tortoises is, right now we're, um, we're in a boom of solar energy development in Nevada. Uh, California also has quite a great deal of energy development going on, but they put a plan on the ground that is protecting them a little bit. And I feel like we're getting spillover in Nevada uh, now that, California has kind of got it um, planned a little uh, uh, um, in some ways. So I think as we move forward and we're deconstructing tortoise habitats on these vast solar fields, that it's an opportunity to do really good experiments 
to understand how to reconstruct tortoise habitat. This is a, these types of manipulations, um, just like the, the diet manipulation that we did, when you do experiments like that, you take the pieces apart, try to put them back together, and then use the little tortoises as our sensors to try to understand, have we done a good job or not? That's the future of our work. And that's what we're engaged with right now to try to make, rather than a series of one-off experiments that we all rush to get the funding for, we want to do it in a coordinated way with this community to try to um, get something coherent out of all the work that's going to happen around solar plants. So thank you very much for the time. Thanks, Todd. That was great. Uh, and uh, so last but not least, uh, I'll uh, pass the baton to Christine. Thank you, Roy. I've uh, been adding up the years. I've worked on desert tortoises, and it's 50. And I uh, have established long-term demographic plots where I can study kelp, demography, and the relationships to the type of habitat, habitat characteristics, as well as the human impacts and the proximity to human activities. There are 15 of these in California in the uh, Mojave and the Western Sonoran Desert. I also have a over uh, two dozen smaller plots or plots that have uh, been covered for shorter periods of time where I've studied the same kind of relationship and what, what factors affects the uh, demography of the population, whether it's juvenile or adults, and what habitat qualities are so important for the tortoise to survive. And some of the answers come with undisturbed habitat, highly protected habitat. And that's protected not only from uh, human incursions, such as off-road vehicles and livestock grazing, but also the issues of uh, hyperpredation. I am currently analyzing data on uh, tortoise rejection when they're translocated from a project that we started in 2008. And we have 10 years of uh, studies on what factors affected the survival. And our next step is comparing where they came from, the habitats, where they came from, the characteristics, and the habitats where they were translocated and how they behaved. Did they leave immediately? Did they come back? And there's some very interesting findings. In the 10 year study, it looks as if one adds up the directions they were headed over those 10 years, it's almost, uh, it's primarily headed in the direction of a home site. So uh, that's something we're going to be exploring in greater detail. I'm currently involved in a head starting project uh, that I picked up from other investigators and uh, have cohorts that extend back to 2003 through 2010. And we track those individuals since they were released. And so we have a pretty good idea of why some individuals have survived and some have not. But then there's the issue of the predators. In terms of uh, contributions to understanding restoration of habitat, I've looked at natural recovery of habitat, both uh, perennials and um, annuals in scraped areas. Uh, particularly the LA aqueduct. And I've also looked at pictures dating uh, from a hundred years or more ago and compared them with the present day situation to see what the habitat was like uh, about the time uh, human beings moved, well, I should say technological 
uh, people moved into the Mojave Desert. So I have a number of projects ongoing and some of the ones I prefer are the uh, behavioral ones, uh, watching what tortoises eat and also how they behave with each other, their social behavior. And I think uh, in the long term, that's something we need to fully understand if we're going to recover the tortoise population. Thank you. Thanks, Christine, and thanks uh, everyone else for, uh, thanks to the entire panel for kind of uh, giving your um, snapshot overviews of your uh, research program for the audience to kind of see what, a lot of the work that's going on um, uh, relative to uh, questions about habitat, habitat restoration, and uh, most importantly, um, uh, habitat quality. So what I want to do now is kind of open things up for uh, an open discussion about, uh, based on all of your all, uh, experience that you've uh, uh, just summarized, what uh, metrics do you think are, are likely to be the most beneficial in informing um, success of habitat restoration for, for tortoise recovery? Uh, or, you know, what are those specific characteristics? We, we might not know exactly what the benchmark is for it, but what are the uh, habitat characteristics that um, we're going to need to focus on to inform um, uh, restoration efforts and to figure out what the specific thresholds, benchmarks, or or uh, whatever the case might be are. And uh, again, this is, I'm hoping that this will be an open discussion and uh, pinging ideas around. Well, I've got to teach class in 20 minutes. So I just wanted to get uh, one couple of questions in and throw in one thought. Um, I've got a, a graduate student who's been working with Mike Westfall and, and doing some blunt nose leopard lizard work. And, and I've been on a few panels over the summer and what has surprised me is the extent to which blunt-nosed leopard lizard, a very different animal from the desert tortoise, also relies on kangaroo rat burrows for a lot of its uh, refuge. And um, the data might be out there. there. There might be mammologists who have this information that, that I should be talking with directly. But um, some questions that kind of come to mind for me are things like, how quickly do the kangaroo rat and small mammal communities bounce back in restored habitats? Tortoises are likely to be sort of at the long tail of recovery in a, a desert community compared to small mammals. But with our experience with um, hatchling desert tortoises, I, I don't think you're gonna see um, real robust recruitment if you don't have uh, the small mammal communities that are digging the kinds of burrows that the juvenile tortoises just largely are using and co-opting and not often capable of digging themselves until they're quite a bit bigger. Um, so do K-rats just recover really quickly in um, restored habitat or even in altered or suboptimal uh, desert community, vegetation communities? Um, or, or are they slow to recover as well? And how similar are the, the broader resource needs of that species or, or that cluster of uh, mammal species and uh, juvenile desert tortoises? Can we use them as maybe an indicator of the direction that uh, restoration success may be headed in a given area? I would suggest that um, having the shrub cover, especially large shrubs like a creosote bush with a large canopy cover and drip line with uh, the potential to form the coppice mound underneath is important in terms of getting some rodent use and rodent burrows. Now, uh, how long it would take for a coppice mound to develop naturally, probably a very long time, but this could be enhanced using uh, some of the soil from disturbed areas. Todd. Yes. Um... I think it depends. I really like, I really appreciate the question. Uh, and I really appreciate the context in relation to the work that all of you guys have done on the juvie tortoises. Uh, because uh, what's one of those most striking um, 
results that I've seen, it really caught my attention about the use of the kangaroo rat bro, bros. Kangaroo rat, kangaroo rat bros, <laughs> easy to say. Um, so we've done quite a bit of work on trapping on burned areas, burned and unburned areas to compare the communities and the burned and the unburned areas. And so the Miriam's kangaroo rats like open areas, relatively speaking, and uh, to an extent. And so what we've seen and we've, um, we've written about it some is how they move in from the edges and the shrubs come back. And we originally said that we didn't think they liked their tails hanging out much more than 30 meters from the edge of a burned area. But uh, the Miriam's kangaroo rats are actually using the friable soil all over the place. So that's good news, I think, because of their facilitation of the seeds. And we, we used, you know, 10 years ago, we, we talked a lot about that when I finished my, uh, some of my work. And um, roads are different because of course they're smaller, but they're severely impacted. So I think they present uh, a different type of challenge. And, uh, but it may not be as important as in burned areas. Now, abandoned solar fields or, um, mine and well sites on the Colorado Plateau and other places are yet a different problem. And so it's the scale and the, and the extent of, the, um, of these disturbances, I think, that are going to be the biggest problem for some of these, these mammals. And certainly, I agree, there's more work we need to do on that to, to bring some of that in. And so I appreciate you bringing the focus on it, Brian. Yeah, um, yeah I have some thoughts on this as well. I think um, that, uh, you know, it it's clear that kangaroo rats are, are ecosystem engineers are important for both uh, the uh, seed dispersal and also for, for digging burrows. I think it's particularly important for the younger tortoises. They can't get um, uh, dig their own burrows as quickly. Um, and so I think, you know, in terms of the, the question about metrics, I think that looking at small mammal burrow density um, at restored sites should be one of the metrics. Um, and you know I, that's really promising what you had to say, Todd, about the sort of natural dispersal and recolonization of an area. Um, in cases where that doesn't happen, we might want to think about uh, translocation of the kangaroo, rat, kangaroo rats or other small mammals that are digging burrows. Um, we've actually done this with uh, California ground squirrels, bringing in them to dig burrows for burrow owls um, successfully. So that's another sort of tool in the restoration toolbox if, if needed. Um, uh, I guess that's, that's all I have to say about the, the burrow issue, I guess. So I'll let someone else speak. Well, there's been so far, you know, I, uh, I think the small mammal burrows may be, um, the importance of small mammal burrows may be kind of, uh, a surprising, uh, feature to a lot of people in the, in the audience. It's not something that's, uh, mentioned a lot, uh, uh, I don't think it came up in, in the literature review. And so um, definitely a, um, a new thing to you know, keep on the radar screen uh, and look into more. And some of the work that uh, people on the panel uh, uh, are looking actively into. Uh, uh, shrub cover came up in the literature reviews and important and, and that uh, was mentioned um, uh, here already. I assume, um, Maybe it's just so obvious uh, that it goes without saying, but just for um, just to make it more explicit, I assume invasive species cover is um, likely to be an important metric uh, that you know somewhere along that spectrum from zero cover to a hundred percent cover of brome uh, is likely to be an important uh, threshold or or benchmarked for restoration. I think you could add the Arab grass with the brome. And I would think a very important metric um, in restoration is the biomass in good years and wet years uh, of uh, the preferred forage plants for the tortoise. You can't survive without uh, good quality forage. And so um, one needs to look also at the proportion of non-native grasses and also the Sahara mustard in the, the habitat because Sahara mustard is expanding the range and moving into um, habitats where it wasn't present 10 years ago. 
So it's a, it's a serious issue and would affect the quality of habitat for the animals. Um, we, both the ants and the rodents are gonna facilitate some of the invasives. Uh, I, I showed the, the, the schismus uh, gets moved by the ants and under certain conditions. And then uh, we have actually, uh, Leslie DeFalco has some watch classes that were uh, uh, shared with us from the Nevada test site from like, I think 50 years ago from Bernie Maza. And they were um, pocket contents from the kangaroo rats. And uh, there are, uh, they're chock full of red broom seeds that are cleaned. And so they were moving them around a long time ago uh, before we were even aware there was an issue. Um, and so there's that, uh, as well as it can be an issue for them, of course. I mean, the, uh, there's that. And then there's the years when we try to study this, as Christine mentioned, that the diet plants that they need uh, absolutely require. Right now, we got a little bit of a problem, which is we've got funded research and nothing's growing out there. It happened last year, and, and right now, there's, again, nothing growing here. So we got two years in a row with no food. Um, and so our research animals that we've released in the field are at risk. We're, we've, we have to have contingencies for what do we do when, a, when the, we put them out there and there's nothing to eat because that's not humane. There's a lot of issues when you do research in this kind of a situation. And so the 400-pound gorilla in the room, I think, is the climate change, which which we now all can talk about and, um, and we need to continue to talk about it because uh, Scott touched on it and uh, I think it'd be um, a good area to keep thinking about. Yeah, um, these are all great points. I think too, um, and it's somewhat related to this, it's, you know, it's, it's, more, it's more difficult to study um, habitat quality in the Anthropocene because everything's changing, climate change, invasive grasses and all that. So, um, you know, you know, traditional occupancy modeling and presence absence may be less informative now than, than it would have been generations ago. But, you know, I think in terms of the, again, back to the metrics that we're looking for for measuring uh, restoration, we've been talking about, you know, the, the conditions on the ground, the habitat, which is of course the obvious thing to, to use, but also looking at, of course, the gold standard for adaptive management is population response. Um, but the, the problem with that is that it's a very slow and delayed measure. So by the time you get your answer from population response, particularly for a species like the tortoise, you know, it's not a, you know, it may, a decade or more may have gone by. I think Todd alluded to this problem earlier. So I just want to put in um, a, a couple of uh, votes for using translocation again as that tool, because that's where you can, you can release tortoises in and measure the response more quickly. And then, you know, I think um, Todd used the word sensor. I use the word probes usually, but um, same concept. Um, and it gives you an opportunity to learn from, from the restoration efforts and which, you know, what works and what doesn't. Um, but also that, um, you know, survival can be a pretty useful measurement with the juveniles. But again, um, looking at the other, there's a lot we can learn from uh, the other behavioral responses, um, you know, where they choose to settle, you know, the habitat that reject versus habitat that they accept, um, the microhabitat use, and those kind of variables can, um, as well as um, growth and health. Those, those are early warning signs or early indicators of, of the quality of the habitat that, that I think should be sort of incorporated into to be, you know, fundamental test of the rest restoration um, success or failure. I just want to put in an explicit plug too that um, Ron mentioned it in passing, and, and I think it's another aspect of it. Uh, yes, populations are slow to respond. So what can you look at in the meantime? Um, a plug for looking at juvenile tortoises is that in the scheme of their populations, they are uh, theoretically at least less valuable um, you can have more of them to start with. Now, we know that balance is changing with the loss of adults in the wild. Um, but a, another benefit of, of juvenile tortoises is that they're still growing at a rate where you can measure their response to um, annual variation, or uh, as Malia has shown, they grow more quickly with native plants than they do with invasive plants. And so if you can get your hands on enough juvenile tortoises in an area, wild free-ranging ones, um, or if you uh, are have a local translocation going on, 
are doing other things to try and actively restore habitat and the tortoise populations therein, you could feasibly use their growth rates as some kind of barometer for the, the quality of that habitat. I don't know that we have a real good sense yet. I haven't seen like a, a real synthetic review of, of what the, the basal expectations are for typical growth. Um, and that would be useful to know so that you can see where, you know, what's the yardstick and how well is, is this area supporting higher than average growth or lower than average? And how does that sort of play out with climate and the, the ratio of invasive to native plants? Uh, but, but survival, yes, and also growth of these tortoises at smaller size where it's still measurable in a meaningful time frame. I'll let Malia chime in here. I was just thinking it might be really used to, useful to think about all of these indicators in the context of like the very specific um, habitat challenges that are being addressed during restoration because thinking through the way that you would quantify success and species response to it, I would consider it potentially different metrics that you would be evaluating in a burned landscape that is generally um, still structurally similar to what it was, except for the absence of the perennial vegetation and potentially the disturbance to the native vegetation versus if you're restoring a landscape that has been leveled for other reasons and you have major soil destruction and disturbance and hardening. Um, and I think that is thinking about it in the context, especially of like how juvenile tortoises respond to the different ecological um, considerations you have where, you know, in the, one of the studies that um, San Diego Zoo and USGS partnered on, the, the big factor was that there were a lot of kangaroo rat burrows available for tortoises, but they still overheated in them because they weren't, they didn't have the perennial vegetation available to help regulate the burrow temperature, I think. I mean, that's unquantified and presumptive, but quite likely an explanation. And then if you're working in a place where you've had severe soil erosion and other disturbance, you may not have the rock structure out there and you may not have soil that's soft enough for kangaroo rats to easily immigrate into and start constructing those structures. And so, you know, within that context of the overarching goal of restoration, you have two very different programs where I think you might, might wanna be setting up different metrics to evaluate whether or not you're moving forward and succeeding in your goals. And, you know, to reinforce what everybody else is saying, yeah, the juveniles are super useful for evaluating that because they're sensitive, um, they die easily, you can put more of them out and it just gives you a really quick indicator of the likelihood that you are gonna see recruitment and the potential your challenges you're facing with your larger animals that are a little bit more resilient and robust. So we're approaching the top of the hour, and I don't know if Julia and Colleen are going to uh, hold this to a hard uh, stop at 11 o'clock. Uh, I know Brian has, to, has a class to teach, but uh, well, I thought we I just wanted to uh, wrap up and, and close and see if anyone had, uh, had comments or, or thoughts for specifically for managers and how they should be in light of what we have in hand today, what we, what we know about uh, tortoise habitat quality, tortoise habitat use and everything that y'all have been talking about. What um, advice would you offer managers uh, about how to think about how habitat quality today and, um, and applying uh, restoration and adaptive management uh, framework. I'll, I'll make one quick suggestion and that's something that hasn't really come up. And that's um, what happens before habitat restoration um, site selection. And, you know, once you've selected the site, you, you know, you, you get what you get and you don't have the fit, right? And um, I think we need, you know, things that have come up like the friability of the soil could be really important, particularly in a restoration context. You know, tortoises eventually will, will be able to deal with the harder soils, but if you went in the, in the kangaroo rats, but uh, more rapid colonization is gonna take place um, if they can dig their burrows more easily. So site selection would be important. Um, um, the other thing I wanted to point out is again, you know, getting back to the idea of um, the predation, 
Um, and if predation is, is an interaction between, you know, the habitat features on the landscape and the, um, uh, and the presence and density of the predators. And if, if you build a wonderful forage environment for tortoises, but it's, clo it's in close proximity to subsidized predators like ravens um, and, their, and trees and power lines for their perch, yeah, you might create a sink, right? You just, you know, you're going to draw tortoises in where the good forage is, but they're going to be suffering, um, you know, unsustainable levels of uh, predation. And also things like camouflage in the substrate, the rocky substrate and cover from vegetation may be, may be enough to mitigate that, um, you, you know, some of that effect of, of subsidized predators. Um, um, but if it's, if, so if you have subsidized predators nearby and for an open habitat with less camouflage, you may be doomed before you even start. Anyone want to close this out? I'd like to say that it always makes me a little queasy when uh, we start prescribing methods to mitigate before we know what the metrics are that actually matter. And I, I think we're a little bit like that, a little bit the cart before the horse in the restoration of tortoise habitat. And so I hope we can use, um, sometimes when you see an issue, is it a disaster or is it an opportunity is always my question. And sometimes if you can turn it into an opportunity, some of the disaster part of it is mitigated. And so these solar plants, I think we should um, use as an opportunity, like I said, to uh, deconstruct and reconstruct habitats in a way that we measure, is it working or not, uh, while we can. And this group and, and the whole community of the restoration and tortoises is now, uh, has enough information that we can start moving toward meta-analyses in collaboration and start to understand uh, the, the, the great differences as you move spatially and temporally through tortoise habitats. Well, thanks, Todd. And uh, Brian, unfortunately, Brian had to uh, uh, head over, head off to class um, uh, before I could thank the, the entire panel for uh, your time and, um, and sharing your experience and thoughts and everything. Uh, I think this, work, this was really good. I think it's a good uh, uh, nexus from uh, Scott's um, uh, opening review to the rest of the, uh, of the workshop and uh, a lot of things for, uh, for people to be thinking about uh, over the next couple of days. So um, uh, thanks for um, your engagement and your time. And I'll turn it back over to uh, Colleen and Julia.